Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> Great to be with you this evening as we talk about what everyone here came to hear about tonight. Submission, true beauty, and the wonder of marriage. <laughs> Submission, true beauty, and the wonder of marriage. See, you're pumped now. You said, man, I picked a good night. To show up. Let's pray. Lord, what an honor to be here tonight. And Lord, we're going through the letter that your servant Peter wrote. Lord, the apostle who walked, talked with our Lord, who our Savior told him, Lord, feed my sheep. And so, Lord, speak to us this evening. God, minister to us in this, um, through your word, Lord. And isn't it we talk about something that is uh, in, increasingly, God, countercultural? Uh, I pray, Lord, that the peculiarity of God's people, Lord, would show the wisdom and the beauty of our Christ, Lord. So help us love you, God. Love your, your wisdom, for God's uh, people and God's family, Lord, and help us adorn your gospel, Lord, in the way we, um, uh, we serve in our families. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. And as I've said before, one of the reasons I preach through the Bible is because it forces me to preach and wrestle with things that uh, sometimes uh, we feel more comfortable ignoring, and, uh, and so I do come this evening with a little bit of trepidation. Uh, but we're going to talk about, as we said, submission, true beauty, and the wonder of marriage, <clears throat> which of course involves uh, the, the biblical view of uh, submission. Uh, uh, his word there in verse 1 is, be subject to your own husband. So that word, uh, the S word, that's is a, is a curse word to some people. Um, but what we have to do is carefully define what the biblical position is and what it isn't. Okay? And, um, and we have to recognize, too, uh, and we have to do that knowing that there, every kind of authority uh, that, got, that exists can and has been abused. But abuse of a principle does not negate the principle. Right? For example, um, children should obey their parents. That's the general principle that's right and good and true. But just because some parents abuse that authority by abusing or neglecting their children doesn't mean that we throw the whole principle of parental authority out the window. Rather, it means we need to properly understand it and properly steward the authority that God gives to parents. Parents, for example, who shepherd and care and love and lovingly discipline their children and who um, delight in their children and try to create a joyful, Christ-centered home, all the while maintaining a firm but loving parental authority. Well, that's a beautiful thing. It's a, it's a fitting thing. But it would be wrong for my children to say to me, hey, Dad, those, kids, those parents over there are abusing their children, so... We're not going to submit to your authority as our father. That's not God's logic. That's the devil's logic. An abuse of a principle doesn't negate the principle. And furthermore, as Christians, we have a far greater concern. You know, the world's going to, the world, of course, you know, the world's value system is just different than ours, right? The world's value system automatically assumes that authority means better. Authority or, or submission and leadership, you know, leadership is better. You know, or it makes one more important. But that's just, that's not God's logic. That's not the biblical logic. Rather, there's just an order, there's a wisdom to which God has chosen to order things, and it's an act of faith and trust in Him to submit to that wisdom. And our, and our concern as Christians, that is, we who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who call on the name, uh, we, our concern is to please Christ. Right? We want to please Christ. We don't, you know, frankly, we, should, we, shouldn't be, we shouldn't be concerned with what the world has to think about it. We should be concerned with what Christ has to, has to say. 
And we must recognize, too, that there are varying degrees in which our intuitions and inclinations have been shaped more by culture than by Christ. I mean, it's true of every generation. We tend to absorb unwittingly the way that the world thinks. And so part of Christian sanctification is seeing where we maybe are prone to think about certain issues the way the world thinks about them rather than the way God thinks about them. And let me tell you something. This, this whole teaching about uh, just marriage in general, but even just something as simple as the gender binary, male and female, is just going to reach a point where it's just going to, it's going to take a lot of courage just to believe in a simple thing that there is such a thing as a man and a woman and that they're different. And that different does not mean better or worse. It just means different because God made it that way. And so we're just going to have to learn to be different in many of these things. And, um, and as a Christian, part of my desire and longing is for God to weed out of my heart then those areas where I may find myself uneasy with his word. Because I must recognize that God ultimately knows better than me or my culture. And since he has chosen me and loved me and saved me, I want to please him. And I want to do that not reluctantly, but wholeheartedly. And so as your pastor, I've been experiencing an increasing conviction that we as Christians, uh, we ought not to apologize for Christ. Jesus said, who's ever is ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of him before my father. And, I, I'm, and, you know, I'm the first one to say that when it comes to issues like this, there is a, man ten, a man-pleasing tendency, of which I'm the chief of sinners, to apologize for teachings uh, in the Bible of things like this that are not culturally popular, popular. But then, when we do that, what we're basically saying is we're ashamed of Christ's plan for the family. And I don't know about you, but see, all this cultural pressure one day is going to evaporate when Jesus Christ returns. And when I stand before Jesus, I don't want to have to, you know, I'd rather have to explain to men why I'm following Christ than have to explain to Christ why I followed man. And I don't want to have to stand before him one day and him look me in the eye and say, Chad, why were you ashamed of what I said about the family. So let's not be ashamed of God's teaching. Let's revel in it. Let's model it. Let's show how it's right and good and wise and true and can create flourishing and thriving and joyful families that nothing in the world can match. And so we're going to spend the next two weeks talking about uh, these things. And so first we're going to... uh, as we talk about submission, true beauty, and the wonder of marriage. And we're going to begin this evening in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. And if you're able and willing, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> it says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word... They may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see you respectful in pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious." For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. The word of God you may be seated. So tonight what I have is I have a, just a, a, a summary statement of this passage that we're just going to that I'm just going to unpack for you. Okay? So the summary statement is this. Wives submit to their husbands to win them to Christ and to adorn themselves with true beauty through fearless faith in God. Wives submit to their husbands to win them to Christ and to adorn themselves with true beauty through fearless faith in God. So the first part here is I'm going to look at this first 
part of this statement. It says, so wives submit to their husbands to win them to Christ. Okay, so, so uh, what the reason, one of the reasons that Peter states here about wives being subject to their husbands, uh, th- there are other reasons, but the uh, one reason he gives here is um, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. So that's at least one reason uh, Peter gives for submission. And so uh, we want to look at some, we fill that out a little bit more as well. We have to ask the question, in general, biblically speaking, why are wives called to submit to their husbands? Uh, this, this is not the only passage that talks about this, and I can't preach every passage on it, but you should look in Ephesians chapter 5, where Apostle Paul talks about marriage, and you should look in 1 Corinthians 11, where Apostle Paul talks about men and women in the church, and you should look at, uh, in 1 Timothy 2, where he's also talking about men and women in the church. And if you go back and if you read those passages, what you'll see is they basically say the same thing that Peter has said here, that the clear biblical pattern is that men are called to be leaders in the home and in the church. And this pattern is theologically grounded in these passages, in many of these passages, is theologically grounded in God's creation. Okay, so there's been lots of argument about these passages and about what they mean, but I just I just think I've found none of the I found none of the arguments against just the simple, straightforward understanding of them compelling because God uh, Paul mo- especially grounds these 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 arguments these uh, this order in the creation order. So not not the Roman culture, not the Jewish culture. It's in creation. Paul argues that God created things uh, to be this way according to His wisdom. And we can look at a few of the passages. For example, 1 Timothy 2, verses 12 through 14. Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. But the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. 1 Corinthians eleven three. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, that the head of a wife is her husband, and that the head of Christ is God. And then... A little bit later in that passage, verse 8, it says, For man was not made from woman, but woman for man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. And so what Paul is doing is he's grounding this teaching in the created, in the created order. That is that God created humanity in a certain order for a certain purpose. Man was made first, and then woman was made out of man. Okay? And what Paul is saying, so, so you got to think like Paul. This isn't... For, for God, this isn't, this isn't a problematic thing for God, right? It, it may be problematic for people living in 21st century America, but it's not a problem for God. God made it this way. Remember when God created everything and at the end of creation, he looked over everything and what did he say? Behold, it's very good. It's good. It's not a problem for God. God saw in his infinite wisdom and beauty that he had, he had made humanity this way. In fact, the Genesis narrative is beautiful if you go back and read it. God creates man, Adam, first. And then, and then before he creates Eve, he has Adam name all the animals. And if you read the passage, it's almost like one of the points that God has in having Adam name all the animals is he wants to show him that there's no other creature... That is fit for him, right? And in fact, that's what it says, that, that, there, was no other cre- that, that I mean, th- there was no other creature fit for him, right? And so it is like God is building this anticipation for Adam. He's like, it's like he's saying to Adam, wait, wait till you see what I have for you, son. <laughs> and then the Bible says that God gives Adam woman from his own body, out of, from one of his own ribs, a helper fit for him. Uh, a, 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 to fulfill a, as a gift to fulfill a role that no other created being could fulfill. Okay, and so that's what Eve was created for, and that together as husband and wife, as man and woman, together humanity, that together they could fulfill God's calling on humanity, right? And so and so that's important to grasp, right? Man and woman, are, they go together. They're, they're both equally human. They're both of equal value and worth, but they are different and they are distinct. And in fact, it's only together that they can fulfill the calling that God has placed on humanity 
And we know that because what was one of the primary callings that God gave humans? Be fruitful and multiply. You can't do that by yourself, right? It takes two, okay, at least. And so, and, so they, and so they could only fulfill God's created order together. And so the order in creation speaks to their differences, man first and then woman. But then the fact that Eve was made out of Adam speaks to their sameness. In fact, Adam says after Eve was created, this at last is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And I shall call her woman, for she was taken out of man. And so, and all this to say that men and women are created different, and though they're, they're equal in, in value and worth, and nevertheless, there is an order, particularly in the, uh, of leadership in the home and in the family. And, and by the way, this is even seen, I would argue, uh, in, in, in the book of Genesis, right? Because, uh, because, for example, as far as we know, Eve wasn't there when God gave Adam the command to not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so it's implied that Adam was supposed to teach Eve what God had spoken, right? And note then that Satan, when he comes, he doesn't come to the man, he comes to the woman, so he's already subverting God's order. And then Adam was there and he didn't do anything. But when God comes into the garden to look for them, who's he looking for? The man, not the woman. He's looking for the man. And so all this to say that these, it, it, God has created in a certain way and, and he, he had a purpose in this way. And so it's, it's good. And God saw that it was good. And so, and so it's part of God's wisdom in it. So the next part there is... What submit, and so, why a submission? And next we're going to look at what submission isn't and what submission is. So I think there's just lots of misconceptions about that. I don't think, when the Bible's talking about wives be subject to your husbands, I don't think it's talking about being a doormat, okay? It doesn't mean you have zero input. Of course it doesn't. Nor does it mean you shouldn't speak up if you feel like a poor decision is being made. In fact, a wise husband is going to heavily wait the, uh, the, the counsel and the, uh, and, the, and the discernment and the sensitivities and perspective of his wife in family decisions, okay? But what it does mean is that the husband is the one of finally accountable to God for the direction and the shape of the family. Another thing submission isn't is it isn't, it isn't tolerating abuse. Abuse is extremely serious, and it's a crime, and so if someone in this room or someone who ever listens to this message is being abused, you need to go to the police and you need to go to and you need to get out of that situation and you need to and 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 and, and, and find some help and get out of that situation. It's, it, it, it's not submission is not an excuse to uh, endure abuse. And then the final thing here is that submission says nothing. It says nothing about skill or giftedness. And so this is, see, the, again, the way, we're, the way we've been trained to think in 21st century culture is that, you know, um, you know it's all about, uh, you know, capacity or skill or things like that. But biblically speaking, that's just, it, that's, that, that doesn't have, it doesn't have anything to do with it, honestly. You know, many of us men are, you know, I'm happy to admit that my wife in many things is more capable than me. But God has put it on me to be the leader of the family. And so that's my responsibility. So, for example, if my wife is better at the finances, what I can say is, hey, honey, I want you to handle the finances. Boom, leadership accomplished. <laughs> I mean, it's not, being the leader doesn't mean you have to control everything. It just means that you're responsible for how things ultimately turn out. Okay. And so, and so if your wife is more capable of something, then my goodness, you'd be a fool not to let her do it and take charge of it, okay? It just means bearing the ultimate responsibility uh, and, and the shape and the direction that your family takes. And so what is submission then? Submission is a posture of heart of a wife to look joyfully to her husband's lead in forming the shape and charting the direction of the family. I'm going to read that again. Submission is a posture of heart of a wife to look joyfully to her husband's lead in forming the shape and charting the direction of the family. 
And so all it is, is it's, it's a heart that acknowledges that God has, uh, look, has appointed the man to be the, the leader and the one ultimately accountable for the direction of the family. And the wife, as one who loves her husband, is going to do everything that she can to, make, to help him succeed in that role so that when he stands before God, he, has, he, he can stand as a faithful steward of him, uh, uh, before God, of his family. And so it's, it's trusting it's, it's trusting. And so that does mean, I would say, then that when it comes, and so that means you're going to talk and you're going to wrestle and you're going to, and you're going to deal with things. But when it comes down to the final decision of the matter, I would say that's ultimately on, on the man, even if it's a difficult decision. And, if he has, and, and that man should make that decision in the fear of God. But I think once that decision is made, it's made and that the man has the ultimate responsibility for that decision. Okay. And so, and so for Peter, what does this mean? What it means there in verse 1 is that even for an unbelieving spouse, it means for a wife to live a beautiful and holy life, okay? And the, the, the context there is that so that if some do not obey the word, that is the husbands that don't obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. And so submission, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a posture of, you know, of, of, of being for them and of, and of honoring them wherever you can, and honoring them in every place that you can, up until the point, of course, uh, of sin. I mean, you, you honor God before you honor your husband, okay? He, but at the same time, it's, it's that posture of seeking to honor, to show respect to your husband in, in every situation that you can. And, um, uh, and note here that I think it's, it's huge that he says that even unbelieving husbands can be won without a word. That means that there's a type of life that a wife can live before her husband that can proclaim the beauty of Christ to even an unbelieving spouse, which is amazing. It can show, it can show, I mean, and and it can show, for example, that the wife loves the husband, not even for the husband's sake, but for Christ's sake. And that actually gives an incredible amount of security to the husband. And not only that, but it humbles the husband. Because most men, most, <laughs> here's a secret that men won't tell you. Because most of them are, are even too proud to acknowledge it themselves. Most men are very insecure. Which is why most men can't handle the feeling of being disrespected. They can't handle it. Why? Because they're insecure. Because they, deep down, know that they, don't, they ain't really cutting it. And, it's, and, and frankly, it embarrasses them. It embarrasses us. And so, so because of that reality, because of that reality, one thing that won't work is nagging. It just won't work. Why? Because men are already insecure and embarrassed, and so if you nag them, what they're going to do is they're just going to clam up, and they're going to harden even harder in their, in, in their hard-heartedness. They're going to clam up. And, by the way, I've never known an unbeliever that was nagged into heaven, but it may be possible to nag somebody into hell. Because you, you, you just, you constantly remind them of how far short that they fall that they just give up. And so it, it, it won't work. But what does work, Peter says, respectful and pure conduct. Respectful and pure conduct. And of course that doesn't mean you never say anything to your husband. What it does mean is that your life is, is one that manifestly shows respect to your husband. There's a famous book written called Love and Respect, and the author's thesis was that, that women want love and men want respect. And I, th- I think there's, there's some merit to that. There's a way in which you can even address issues, but in a way that shows that you respect your husband. You know, just, just for example, you can say, Honey, I love you. There's something I want to talk about. Have you noticed this in our relationship? This issue. I want you to know I'm with you whether this gets better or not, but is there something we can do to fix it? What does that do? Well, it addresses an issue, but it shows your husband you respect him. And not only that, but it, it's coming and you're asking him, What can we do? And what are you doing? You're looking for him to lead in that situation. 
and you're looking for him, you're asking him to say, hey, this is things you've no, you know, I've noticed it, you've noticed it. What can we do to make it better? Okay. And if, and if gentle and respect, and if that is the, if that's the tenor, I believe, of your relationship, and that, and that tone, that gentle and respectful tone is adorned by a humble, holy, consistent life of pure conduct, bathed in prayer, where even your husband knows that you treat him better than you deserve, man, God can use that. God can use that. And no, it's not, and no, it's not guaranteed, but, but at the same time, Peter clearly sees that, that that's something that God can and, and many times will use to draw an unbelieving husband to knowledge of the Lord. But also means too, and this, this is an aside, but also means too, be, be careful who you marry, folks. I'm dead serious. Marriage is serious. Till death do us part. That's serious. You better just make sure you know. A marriage that's not built upon God, you're in a dangerous spot. Dangerous spot. Respectful and pure conduct softens the heart. And so um, a major goal in this, Peter says we talked about, is to win the husband. Now, of course, it would be wrong, as I just, this, Peter's not giving a license to marry a lost husband. Paul says, don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. But it was not uncommon then, and it's, and it's not uncommon now, for uh, one spouse to become converted, uh, to become converted after, after marriage. And, then, and now you're in a situation where you have to learn, where, where now your whole value structure has been flipped on its head. And now God is your highest treasure. And now you have to learn to live with someone whose God is not their highest treasure. And now you have to wrestle with all of that. And God will help you and God will strengthen you. And that's part of what Peter is envisioning and talking about, how to do that in a way that, uh, that honors and pleases God. But it, it's reality and that, and, and that happens. But part of this is what Peter is saying is that Part of the biblical beauty of submission is that women can wield it as a weapon against their husband's unbelief. <laughs> you can wield it against your husband's unbelief. And by the way, it's not just relevant for a marriage between a uh, believer and unbeliever, because this kind of spirit is also going to encourage and strengthen a believing husband. And the more the believing husband sees that his wife really respects him, and is looking to him to lead the family, the more that believing husband is going to say, man, she's looking to me. I got to step it up. I got to make sure that I'm leading this family the way it needs to be led in fear of the Lord. Okay. So, <clears throat> so wives submit to their husbands to win them to Christ. And then this next part here. And to adorn themselves with true beauty through fearless faith in God. To adorn themselves with true beauty through fearless faith in God. Okay, so what Peter is getting at here in, in the, the, the following verses here, 3 through 6, is that he wants to see truly beautiful women within the church. And you say, well, that sounds vain, Pastor. And I would say, yes, that's his point. <laughs> that's his point. That too many women are focused on external beauty instead of cultivating the internal beauty of the soul. <clears throat> now, you know, just to be clear, no, I'm not even going to say that. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't mean you, you, you try to, it doesn't mean it's a virtue to like, you don't, you don't try to look bad. <laughs> that's, not, that's not a virtue either. It's just saying that that's not the most important thing, Right? It's not the most important thing, right? What if we spent as much time cultivating our souls as we did our body or our hair or our makeup or our clothing choices? What if we did that? Proverbs 31.30, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. 
And this is hard today because of the culture that we live in. And despite the, you know, despite the, the, the Me Too movement and the things that that has brought to awareness, the reality is, is that it's the progressives in our culture who have sown the wind of hypersexualizing everything and are reaping the whirlwind of abuse and societal decay. TV shows, media, advertisements push, push, push women into thinking that their worth is found in their physical attractiveness. And it's just not true. It's not true. And there's, there's just untold scores of women who really believe, well, if I, if I was just a little more attractive, then he would have loved me. Then he, he wouldn't have treated me like that. It's not true. It's not true. Your worth is found in God. Your worth is found in Jesus Christ. And for eternal ages to come, when our eyes have been glorified to see as God sees, then what we will then see is that the most beautiful woman in heaven will have been the holiest here on earth. And not the most whatever. And if, you tr- and if you're trusting in your appearance to make yourselves attractive, I'm just warning you. Again, I'm not saying it's a virtue to look frumpy for the sake of looking frumpy. But if you're trusting in your appearance to win you a man, then chances are you're going to find a man who's primarily interested in you for your appearance. And that's almost a certain recipe for disaster. I'm just telling you. The Bible says, clothe yourselves with godliness, with holiness, with what Peter calls a gentle and quiet spirit. When you dress, dress in a way that draws attention to your face and not to your body. Why? Because you're more than your body. Right? I'm about to get in trouble. Hold on. <laughs> Leave something for your husband. Every man doesn't need to know every curve on your body. In fact, there is something wonderfully securing and respectful and trusting that does to a husband's heart when a husband knows, man, every man out there doesn't know the curves of my, my wife's body, just me. I'm the only one. I'm the only one she entrusts that part of herself to. Because that's what, it's, that's what it belongs to. It's a gift. It's, it's a gift for marriage. Right? So dress in a way that draws attention to your face and not to your body. Let your adoring then be not external, he says, the braiding of hair, the putting on of jewelry, the clothing that you wear, but it be the hidden person of the heart, the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Why? Because you're not ultimately dressing for man, you're dressing for God. Remember what the Bible says? Whether you eat or drink or get dressed... Or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. All right? And then finally, in verses 5 and 6, uh, Peter holds Sarah up as an example, right? Uh, he says, there, he says, This is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. And so, in, verse, in, uh, in Genesis 18, when the Lord had come to Abraham and said that he was going to have a son, and, uh, and, and Sarah laughed. And in Genesis 18, 12, it says, Sarah laughed herself, saying, After I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? And what's fascinating about that is that's kind of a knock on herself and on Abraham. But she calls Abraham Lord. And that's, that seems to be what Peter's referring to. And it seems to me that what impresses Peter about that is it seems that Sarah's respect and submission to Abraham was just part of the, the warp and woof of her life, just part of her personality. And by the way, if you read the Bible, it doesn't really seem like Sarah's a pushover. <laughs> but she respected her husband. And 
Here she is given the commendation. Uh, she's given the commendation. Holy women who hoped in God. And that's the key right there, and that brings us to the last part. It says, Wives submitted their husbands to win them to Christ and to adorn themselves with true beauty through fearless faith in God. Through fearless faith in God. That's what it says in verse 6. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. What does that mean? I think it means that God wants his daughters to be fearless. So remember the context, right? In verse 1 there, it says, Likewise, and it's clearly referring to what we talked about last time, about slaves to masters. Remember what it says, slaves to masters? He's talking about that some would be unjust, wicked, and yet they were still to submit. And in the same way, what he's saying is that, uh, why, and, and then the clear context here is that he understood that some wives would be married to unbelievers. And so, of course, what he's saying is that it's going to be frightening sometimes to be married to an unbeliever or to be married to a man that doesn't love you like he ought to. Okay? And so what he's saying is that, but their hope, and that's what it says, in verse 5, it says, This is how holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husband. So note, note here, the wife's hope is not her husband. The wife's hope is God. You hope in God. <laughs> Let's just be real, folks. You don't have to be married too long to realize you can't hope in your spouse. <laughs> you just can't. You can only hope in Jesus Christ. Because your spouse, the best spouse, will let you down. And if all your hope is in your spouse, you're not going to make it. Because the best spouse will let you down. The only way marriages can really last is if your hope's in God. Because God will never let you down. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to love your spouse not for their sake, but for Christ's sake. And that's the only way it can last. Loving your spouse for Christ's sake. And that's the only thing that will enable you to endure difficult situations like people are often faced with. For example, again, like if, you're, if, you're, if you become converted and you're married to an unbeliever. Okay? What does it take? It takes faith. It takes hope in God. You have to trust God. You have to trust God in the middle of that situation. And yet, Peter envisions that a woman can be fearless in this regard. And not fearless in the sense of not that she has zero fears, but that she takes her fears to God. And she trusts God more than she trusts her fears. And she surrenders herself to God and trusts in him and does what? And, and lives this type of life that, that Peter is commending in hopes that what? That her husband will be converted. That her husband would come to know and love God. You know, there's a, there's a in Proverbs 31 where it talks about the excellent law, excellent wife, there's a, a very striking verse <clears throat> that's always stood out to me. It says, she laughs at the time to come. She trusts God, so she's not afraid of what's going to happen. Because God's going to work, and God's going to act, and God's going to take care. You know, the number one most com- repeated command, the number one most repeated command in the entire Bible is do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't fear. For I'm God. And I'm with you. And because God is God, you can trust him. So submission is not an act of self-deprecation. It's an act of faith. It's an act of faith. Not in your husband. It's an act of faith in God. To trust God, I'm going to work out in this situation. And I've heard some hard, I've heard some hard things. To squ- you know, I listen to this podcast, and and you know, and people ask us some very difficult questions. You know, and 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 it can, it can be in life. I mean, it can be. You know, you just you feel you feel you might you might feel just trapped in a a bad marriage. And. We can pray and and work and do things that God might help that. But reality is, and here's just a cold, hard reality, folks, because I think lots of people have have wrong expectations. 
this side of this side of glory, we're not promised heaven, folks. Life is hard. Marriage is hard. It's not always going to be candy and roses. But guess what? We can hope in God. We can trust God. And you know what? The Bible says that marriage is temporary till death do us part. And in heaven, we'll neither be married nor given in marriage. It'll, it, because why? Because marriage was a pointer. It's a po- marriage is a pointer to something greater than marriage. And that's what Paul talks about in Ephesians 5. It's a, it's a picture of Christ and the church. And so in our marriages, we, call, we put the glory of Christ in the relationship of Christ and his church on display in our marriages. And let me tell you something. The church in Christ, it, it's been messy at times. Not his fault, our fault. But guess what? Jesus still loves us. Jesus still loves us. And so we have the privilege in marriage to show to the world the difference that Christ makes in us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for...